Welcome to, whoa, that's loud. Welcome to Mountainside Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here this morning, and we are excited to be in God's house today. It's going to be a good day today. If you're outside that way, it smells really, really good. It smells really, really good, and uh, but we are looking forward to it today. We're going to have a good time in God's house this morning. Uh, so let's take our hymnals. Let's stand. We're going to turn to page number 275. Page number 275. We're going to sing that first, second, and fourth verses Page number 275, first, second, and fourth verse. this morning i know the men the men yeah the chili the men probably slept quite well last night i know i know i slept very very well last night there's a difference between sleeping in a nice house versus sleeping outside and it's 40 degrees outside but we slept, had a great time and uh most of the of the old men that went with us all three all three the all three the dads know old men went with us if we're kind of limping and crawling around it's because we played soccer with the with the boys for about an hour and a half on the side of a mountain at six thousand feet 
So we're all quite sore, and all the kids are like, let's keep going, let's keep going. We're like, we got to sit down. <laughs> and so we had a great time yesterday at the Men and Boys Camp Out. The last two days at the Men and Boys Camp Out, had a good time. Got to hike up to the top of, what was that mountain that we climbed to the top of? Do you remember? The highest peak there. What was, what was, what was that? How, what, was, what, was, what, was, what was the name of that mountain? We climbed to the very top of the worst with the... Mountain Union, climbing to the top of Mountain Union, the tallest peak in uh, Yavapai County, and uh, it was pretty, quite, quite good views. We could see the fire. We could see the burning fire from a ways off from the different forest fires and things like that. They didn't come close to us, praise the Lord, uh, but we had a good time with that as well. Some good time of fellowship, good time around God's Word as well, and uh, we had some singing that night and all those kind of things. Had some good food, had some good grilling and all those kind of things. That's what men like to do. They grill steaks and hamburgers and hot dogs and all the good man stuff. And we had, ate all of that good stuff as well. And so we're going to have a video presentation uh, after, our, after our morning service. We'll let you see that and let, all the, let everybody see what happened and let all the ladies know that we survived and we're okay and everything like that. And so had a good time with that. Also included with that is the youth rally. I also added the youth rally. So you'll get to see uh, some pictures and things of the youth rally as well and all of those kind of things. Uh, so looking forward to that. So th we'll do that right after the morning service, and then we'll break out. And we may have to close those doors, because as long as we're smelling that chili now, I'm telling you what, that's, that's some good smells right there. And uh, thankful for you. So don't forget also that's coming up, uh, coming up very soon is the um, 15th anniversary revival. Uh, looking forward to that as well. That will be November the 1st through the 3rd. Brother Terry Randolph will be coming to preach for us. I encourage you to mark your calendars for those. Uh, make sure you're available to come on each of those nights. It'll be Sunday morning, Sunday night. Tuesday, uh, Monday night, and then Tuesday night. So make sure you're available for each one of those. Uh, Brother Randolph's a great man of God. be preaching the word for us and, and uh, giving us uh, the message that we need to hear for our 15th anniversary revival. Uh, really looking forward to that. L really looking forward to uh, celebrating and worshiping the Lord together with that. And then also don't forget, November the 15th, we'll have our End Time Sunday. Brother Dick Webster will be here. Uh, he's going to begin in Sunday school. It's going to be a three-part series. He'll start in Sunday school, morning service, evening service. They'll tie all together. All three of them will tie all together. Uh, and he's working on that and be, be here for that as well. So don't forget about that. Have lots of different things. And then, of course, November the 22nd, we don't have a slide for that, but that'll be Thanksgiving Sunday. How many of you like turkey? How many of you like cranberry sauce? I love me some cranberry sauce. I found out the other day that the dollar store sells the small cans of cranberry sauce. I thought, man, that's the perfect kind to just sit with a spoon and just have a good time with it. And it's only a dollar. I, I'm, so we're going to have some cranberry sauce and things like that, some good stuff. How many of you like mashed potatoes? You like some mashed? You got to have mashed potatoes. What else? I don't know stuffing. I don't like stuffing, but some of y'all like stuffing and gravy, things like that. She's just like serve it all, and uh, we're already hungry. We can already smell the chili, and we're already thinking about Thanksgiving food. So that will that'll be that'll be that Sunday uh, before Thanksgiving, just like we did last year. We'll have our our evening meal there together as a family with some turkey and dressing and all those kind of things as well. So looking forward to have lots of things going on here at Mountainside Baptist Church. And so make sure you mark all these in your calendar. We're looking forward to being a part of all of those uh, different things. Let's take our text and we'll go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2 uh, this morning. Galatians chapter number 2. Begin reading in verse number 11. Galatians chapter number 2. Beginning reading in verse number 11. Galatians chapter 2. Beginning reading in verse number 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked, not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the day. Thank you so much for the opportunity we have to uh, worship you and to sing your praises. Thank you so much for this opportunity we have to uh, have some time of fellowship one with another today. We pray that you bless our afternoon service as well. We pray, Lord, you'll speak to our hearts this morning and this afternoon. And Lord, I just pray, God, you'll bless our day today. We thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for us that we might have everlasting life. We pray, Lord, you be with our missionaries today, Lord, as they serve you as well and other respective places all around the world. 
We pray, Lord, to bless our day. Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you as our Lord and personal Savior, Lord, let them, that they may make their salvation sure before they leave this place. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue singing. Page number 628. Page number 628. My Savior's love. We'll sing that first, second, and fifth verse. My Savior's love. That first, second, and fifth verse. Page number 628. First, second, and fifth verses. On that first verse. I stand amazed in the At the remainder of this song, page number 360, that first, second, and fifth verse is as well. First, second, and fifth verse as well. Page number 360, there is a fountain.
to the Lord in prayer today. My mouth's already watering. I can just all that chili. But let's have Brother uh, um, Luchek, if you'll guide our offering this morning. Amen. You may be seated. One more time, let's stand page number 596. 596, we'll sing all three verses. Victory in Jesus, we know this one pretty well. Let's look together.
very good singing. You may be seated this morning. Make sure we're on good. Get the ring out. Junior church, you may be dismissed. Junior church, you may be dismissed at this time. And nursery. Junior church and nursery may be dismissed at this time. i got to get the new one. i got to get it memorized in my mind. She's like, <laughs> yeah, without her, that's why she's the help me, right? I and mean, she helps more than, more than normal people do. Right? We're thankful for that. And we're thankful for all of that. Every time that door comes open, it just wafts right in here. just wafts right in here. But we're looking into our text this morning. You know, Paul was an apostle of consistency. Uh, one of the things that could be said about Paul is no matter where he was, no matter where he uh, was ministering, no matter what place that God had uh, placed him, no matter where he found himself, no matter what the situation was, no matter the difficulty, no matter the blessings, whatever it was, Paul lived a life of consistency. His life was the same whether he was under persecution, whether he was under blessing. Paul had said before that I know how to be abound and how to be abased. And he understood those things. And no matter where he was, no matter who he was fellowshipping with, no matter whether he was under attack by the leadership of the cities or the maybe even the leadership of the people within the church or whether they were helping him and whether they were working for him and, and being a blessing and ministry to him, he lived a life of consistency in his life. And he believed and he behaved and acted the same way no matter who was around or who might come around. How many of you remember when you very first met your spouse? Y'all remember that? For some, it may be so long that you just, you just don't remember it anymore. But do you remember how, especially if you're a guy, I don't know how many will be honest, you remember how all of a sudden the lady would come by and all of a sudden we go, Right? So we, we'd all, we'd all, all of, a, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we were the NBA player, right? Every, all of a sudden, if we were on the basketball court, I got next, you know. All of a sudden, if we like to play basketball, she showed up in the bleachers, and the next thing you know, we became, we became Stephen Curry, you know, and we were just, you know, we had to show off, right? All of a sudden, we just had to do that, or all of a sudden, we had to prove how smart we were, or things like that. I kind of got in trouble with Angela's dad because I asked her one time while she was driving on the road, when was the last time you changed your headlight fluid in your car? And I really got her going with that, and then she calls her dad, and she said, he said, oh, he got mad. You, you fell for that? But right, we, we pretend to be all of a sudden, we pretend to have all the answers just because she's there. But it's really the same on the other end. You remember that? All the ladies, you remember when your man walked through or walked in the door? Some are like, eh. I remember that. <laughs> Ashley came home the first time after she had met Micah, and she came home. She's wearing this just grungy old jacket. You know, it looked like it had been through about four different wars, and I don't know what happened to it. And I said, Ashley, why are you wearing that? You would, I, you would never wear that. She goes, well, this is Micah's. This is Micah's. I said, oh, he doesn't wear nice clothes. I got gotcha. you. But, you know, it's, he wears this jacket, right? So because he was there and because, because it was him, all of a sudden, something that she probably wouldn't even have taken down to goodwill. Now, because it's his, all of a sudden it changed, right? All of a sudden her attitude changed. And all of a sudden that we could think about this and we could think about how we change and a lot of times how we react differently. We've all been there with the job and it just seems like we're goofing around the job and all of a sudden the, the, the boss comes in and he closes the door and all of a sudden everybody's back to work again, right? All of a sudden, right? So, so they're not living a consistency. They're, they weren't working before, but just because the boss shows up, now all of a sudden we're working. Now all of a sudden we're, we're trying to put that time in. How many of you have ever been told by your parents to clean your room? And you remember that? Mom and dad leave, and by the time I get home, your room better be clean, right? Remember that? And then all of a sudden, we're goofing around, goofing around, and maybe one of us has a window that looks out to the front porch, and the car pulls in, and all of a sudden, now it's a mad dash to jam everything we can under the bed or jam in the closet and shove the closet door closed so it looks like it's really clean. When we used to live in North Dakota, we had a little bit of a farm. We had a little farm, and we had goats, and we raised goats, and we milked our own goats. And for about two years, we never drank goats, or cow's milk. We drank our own goat's milk and had all that. And so our house was quite a ways down off of the property. It was a couple hundred yards off the property. And so we would always have our instructions or things that we were supposed to get done while mom and dad were gone. And so then, because there's five of us, we always had the lookout. 
And so the lookout would be watching to make sure so they could, they could, see, they could see when the car turns onto our driveway. And we understood, we, we, we figured it out. It was about three to five minutes from the time they turn to the time they get to the front porch down that way. And we understood, we have three to five minutes to get done everything that we were supposed to get done by the time they get down there. All right, I, we were the only ones that did that. Okay, all right, I understand that. I understand that. You see, what, we, what, was, what was happening was... We weren't living consistent lives. We would say and pretend that we were good, obedient children, but at the same time, we were trying to connive and work the system, right? We were trying to, we were trying to make it to fit to us. So we wanted to goof around. We wanted to play, but at the same time, we knew there were things to do, but we only reacted or we only acted a certain way when certain people were around or when mom and dad was around. How many of you have ever been told by your parents, now, when we go in here, you have to behave be quiet right my my parents my favorite thing we went to a mall was fold your hands so we walked around stores like this why because kids are grabby right they like to touch things and it's interesting they never touch the things that can that won't break it's always the glass jar it's always the thing why are you touching that that's the one thing and now it seems like children always want to touch the most expensive thing in the store, too. Like, if that breaks, we're going to have to go get a personal loan or sell our house to be able to afford it. Why, do you, why not touch the rubber ball? Because if you bounce that, then it's, it's, it's 99 cents, right? They behave a certain way just because of who is around or what is happening in a certain area. It's not a life of consistency, but Paul wanted to help us to understand that we as Christians in our spiritual lives, especially in the way that we live around without the world and around other of God's people, needs to be a life of consistency. It didn't matter if Paul was among Jews or Gentiles. He lived and acted in what the same the group of men that travel with him were of both races and were, were, were Jews and Gentiles. We can see in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he, he describes that, that, that Timothy is with them and others that are with them. And it didn't matter who was with Paul or who was fellowshipping with Paul, who was traveling with Paul. He lived a life of consistency. The things that he believed around one group of people was the exact same thing that he believed around another group of people. The way that he lived and acted and spoke and talked was the same no matter who he was with or no matter where he was. He consistently lived the same and believed the same among all of them and practiced his faith around the same among the, any, whoever was with him. And Paul explains that though he was a Jew, verse number 15, he did not expect those that were Gentiles among him to live as a Jew. He didn't, he didn't live one way, and well, because this is the way I live, you have to do it the same as well. Nor did he change it the other way around. Nor did he demand that the Gentiles should convert to Judaism or anything like that. Then, and that was a problem that was going on in, our, in this society, in this time of, of Christianity, in this time of the early churches. There were different people that believed one thing and they were teaching one thing. And there was no, seemed like there was no consistency sometimes between what different people were teaching and, and what different people were preaching. And there were Jews that were going around who were saved and they knew Jesus Christ was a personal Savior. But they wanted to add to salvation. They wanted to demand that everyone that got saved or that everyone that was in the church became circumcised and began to pick up that of Judaism. They began to teach that circumcision and obedience to the law of Moses was, was a part of salvation, was necessary for salvation, so that they would go along and they were preaching and teaching this in different places. They were teaching that they ought to adopt the ritual ceremonies and observe the strict food laws and separate from the Gentiles and, and do those kind of things, but that's not what God was taught from the Word of God. There's only one way to be saved, and it's consistent among all people, correct? And then there's nothing to add to it or nothing to minus from it. But here was Paul began to travel to different places and began to understand that seemed like people were living and believing and acting depending on who was there and depending on who showed up. And Paul is going to help us to understand that the Word of God is the same. The Word of God preaches the same, teaches the same, no matter who's reading it, no matter where it is, no matter what church it is, no matter what country it is. This is the same. Salvation is the same. People in Argentina don't get saved differently than people in the United States of America. People in Africa don't get saved differently than people in the United States of America. Now, the methodology from which they get saved, if someone is a deaf person and they do sign language, that's how they talk, they may speak their salvation and call upon Christ with their hands. But guess what? They still got saved exactly the same way. 
Someone may call upon Christ in Gatajano, but he's still getting saved the same way. It's all the same all across the board. But Paul had begun to see that in different people's Christian lives, no matter where they were, or depending who they were around, their, their Christianity, their lifestyle, the way that they lived, was, seemed like it was determined based on who was there and who was not there. What was happening at the event or what was taking place. And among all this controversy was the church of Antioch in Galatia, and this controversy was solved. In Acts chapter 15, they had a men's fellowship meeting, and some people say, well, we don't know if we like fellowship meetings. Acts chapter 15 was a fellowship meeting of all pastors coming together and having a fellowship meeting, and they, and they agreed among themselves, and they agreed that the Word of God is clear, that it teaches that salvation is by faith in Christ alone, not by works, not by circumcisions, not by becoming a Jew, not by adopting all kinds of ceremonial laws, none of those things. And those things didn't change based on what church was there. didn't change based on who was preaching for the day. And Paul is going to help us understand that our spiritual life, as in salvation, ought to be a life of consistency and ought to be a life of uniformity in our, in our, in our belief, in our faith. The church was facing a major split because of the inconsistent testimony of the life of one of the greatest apostles. And here was Peter. And as we read this story, we can find that that was pretty good. It was a pretty good confrontation. Verse number 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Can you imagine that conversation? One great apostle with another great apostle. And this great apostle telling this great apostle, you're not living right. There's some inconsistencies in your life and it's hurting the church and it's hurting the people that were around and, and it's hurting the faith and it's, it's hurting those that would, that would be looking up to you and they're looking for you to an example. And he was Peter and he was to be blamed, Paul says in our text. But here was his problem. We want to see some things this morning, three things about Peter that we should learn that Paul pointed out in his life to help Peter to become a, a consistent Christian and one that would live the same and live righteously no matter who was around or no matter what was taking place. We can find in our text here that Peter was not blamed for communing and eating with the Gentiles. We can see that in verse number 11 and 12 that when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face for, because he was to be blamed. But for before that, certain came from the Jews. He did eat with the Gentiles. But when, when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. I mean, it really wasn't wrong for Peter to be eating with the, Jew, eating with the Gentiles. And so Paul is going to help Peter understand why would you change from one to the other? Why all of a sudden was one okay? And then now just because someone showed up, it's, it's no longer good anymore. He was, he was living a double life. James chapter 1 verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You see, here was Peter, and he was living one way around certain people, and then depending on who showed up, he began to live and change and began to live a certain way around these other people, and he knew that his life was okay. Acts chapter 10, verse 11 was clear. God showed to Peter that it was okay to eat meats, and it was okay to eat with the Gentiles. It was okay to fellowship with them. It was okay to have a good time with them. It was okay to see them get saved. It was, it was, a good, it was okay for them to, to plant churches and to see souls get saved and baptized it was okay for him to mix with them but there were at the time a certain sect of jews that were coming out of the churches that were trying to teach and preach that there was supposed to be a separation that only churches could have only jews or that churches could only have gentiles but that's not what god teaches again we're all equal in the word we're all equal in salvation Amen. It doesn't make a difference who we are. It doesn't make a difference where we come from. It doesn't make a difference what our background is. It doesn't make a difference what our nationality is. None of that matters. We are all equal in this way. But here was Paul, and he was coming to Peter, and even Peter was getting caught up in this movement that some were saying that only certain people could be part of the church or only certain people could be saved, and, and these people could be saved so long as they turned over and became us and that they became who we were. But that was changing and adding to salvation. It was changing and adding to what God had never intended from the word of God. But it was not wrong for Peter to fellowship with these people. It was not wrong for him to minister with them. It was not wrong for him to fellowship with them. But it was wrong for Peter to all of a sudden act as if they were not right with God and act as if they were not serving God, act as if, if there's something that needed change just because these people were here now visiting or in his presence. 
And he knew that life was okay, but yet he lived another way with certain people. He knew that these people, he, honestly, he, he knew, he understood, Peter understood the gospel. He knew what the Bible said. He knew what the word of God taught about salvation and, and how to live a righteous life. He knew that, and yet for some reason, because he himself was a devout Jew in, in his sense, and because he tried to follow that Jewish law, even in Acts chapter 10, he, in verse 11, he even argued with God about eating meats. And, no, I'm a Jew. I don't do those kind of things. And, God began to teach him and begin to show him. But just because they were around, he changed. Because they were around, he changed his life. In fact, he changed the way that he taught. He changed his doctrine just because they were around. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 through 1 and 5 says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. They were trying to add to it. But there rose up certain of the sects of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. But Peter knew and understood that that's not what God taught. But just because they were here and he wanted to mingle with them and he wanted to make right with them and he wanted to have a right fellowship with them, he was willing to sacrifice a relationship, a right relationship with the Gentiles just because they were present, just because they were there. In verse number 12, for in our text there, before that certain came from the Jews, he did eat with the Gentiles. And he was fine to eat with the Gentiles and fellowship with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that was of the circumcision. He was so worried about what these people thought about him. He was so worried about what they might say because he was sitting over here and sitting and eating and fellowshipping with the Gentiles. He was so worried about that. He was willing to give up what he really even knew what was right in order just to, just to impress them. Just to keep them happy. Just to keep them from saying bad things against him. He wasn't living a consistent life. He was, Peter was here. He was stuck. He was trying to live a double life. He was trying to live a life to, plead, to appease these people. He was trying to live a life to appease these people. And Paul says we're all of the same salvation. We all get saved the same way. And so there's no reason it's not right for us to live one way. And then like, right for us to live another way around another group of people. I've seen it all the time. We have, a, we have a Christian life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And then we have a, another Christian life on Sunday. We live a different way, right? Because we know who's going to be there. And all of a sudden, we don't, we don't talk a certain way. We don't act a certain way. Because, hey, we know that they're there. My father would always, he'd always chuckle. He liked to visit people, and especially people that were visiting the church, and just like my sister and I do, and it's always fun sometimes when you knock on the door, and people say, who's there? Who's that? And they look through the window, and all of a sudden, you can hear rustling and shuffling, and there are people putting stuff away, and they're shuffling all around, and trying to get everything put away, and hide things, and do all this kind of stuff, and then they open, hey, preacher, how you doing? Come on in. We're doing okay. Don't go in that room over there. It's a mess. They threw everything in there. What was happening was, is preacher's there, so... He's going to expect us to live a certain way or do be a certain way. So I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change you. I'm going to hide all the things that I think are good for me, but I don't think preacher's going to like. And so I'm going to show preacher one life that I live, but yet at the same time, I, in reality, I'm living a whole different life. And if preacher's not there, all of this stuff is okay. And everything that I'm looking at, I'm watching, reading, seeing on TV, it's all okay. But as soon as preacher says, well, we got to shove all that stuff aside. We can't let him look at that. It seems like we have to show a different side of us. And Peter was living this double life, and he was living this life of one versus the other. Depending on who was there, depending on what was happening, he lived that double life. He was also living a wavering life. You see, his influence was causing Paul. I mean, here's Paul. We can see from the Word of God this confrontation that takes place that really should never have to take place. But because of his inconsistent life, he was damaging the church, and the church itself was beginning to have some inconsistencies within it, and, and some were going after the one, and some were trying to follow Peter, but hey, I guess it's okay for us, and new Christians were coming along, and hey, okay, let's, let's, Peter's here, and, and he's the apostle, so we're going we're gonna to follow him, we're, gonna, we're trying to learn, and he's the man of God, so we're here, and we're learning, we're, we're doing, and, and those people come in, oh, wait, wait. What I'm doing, I don't understand. Now, now what I'm doing is bad. Now I'm doing is wrong because he's over there now and he's telling us that we have to do something different. And it was causing a confusion and dissension within the church. He was hurting it. Paul had already dealt with the Galatians. The Galatian people were already struggling with the gospel and already struggling with 
what they knew should be right. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. I marvel that you're so soon removed from that which called you in the grace of Jesus Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And they're already struggling. They're already having a hard time with learning the word of God. And yet here was Peter and he was, he was teaching them one thing and this is how we live and this is how we work and this is how we serve the Lord. And oh, now they're in here and someone come over here. Now you guys, no, no, no. Now you guys have to do this. And now you have to live this way. And now you have to, now you have to follow after what these people say. And as soon as they leave, he's going to go right back to what he was doing before. And it's causing confusion within the church. It was causing a split. And the church had begun to not follow after the church, after the truth. And Paul talks to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before who eyes Christ Jesus hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, receive ye the spirit of works by the law, or by hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Why are we going back and forth? But in the midst of all of this unwavering, in the midst of all of this trying to, maybe trying to straddle the fence, was Peter right in the middle of it. And his influence was causing undue pressure within the church. And there were some that just, I don't, I don't know what to believe. I, when, we, when Peter was preaching this, and now that these people are visiting, and now we had to do something else, and it was, it was causing a division. There wasn't any kind of a consistency. And, and Peter was going to help Peter understand, no matter where I am, no matter who I'm with, if, if I'm with the Gentiles and we're fellowshipping with, and those folks come in, I'm going to stay right here and continue to fellowship and commune. And my life doesn't change. My life isn't isn't based upon who is there or what's going on around me. My spiritual life is my life with my Christ. It, it doesn't change between one of the two. And so Peter's predicament, we see his problem, but now, now it had pro caused a problem within the church and his hypocrisy had begun to build a following. We can see from our text there in verse number 13. In verse number 13, and other Jews dissembled, Likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with his dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews. I mean, it didn't make any difference. You're, the, you're a Jew, you're there, you are, you are a Jew of the Jews. And as Jesus and Paul himself declared in verse number 15, we are Jews by nature, but if you're going to live a life, of a, live a life with the Gentiles and, and live and serve the Lord with them, why then do you demand that they all of a sudden become Jews just because a few other Jews show up that aren't even teaching the truth, aren't even teaching right? This word dissembled here, it's an interesting word. It means concealed under a false pretense. Concealed under false pretense. You see, Peter was trying to hide and pretend when these people showed up that he wasn't among the Gentiles. Oh, I was he just made something up, or he was not only the he was not he really wasn't even the only Jew within the church mixing with Gentiles, but just because these Gentiles showed up, all of a sudden he would act as if he never he wasn't even over there in the first place. How many of you have ever caught your children doing something and you gave them a chance, but they pretended to be righteous anyway? Oh, I didn't. I didn't touch that. Well, let's see. Let's do some logic here. There's only two of you, and the one's been over here the whole time. Pretty much was you, right? No, he's... he's he was, he, was he was dissembling, right? Your, your child was dissembling. He was, he was concealing his truth under a false, a false appearance. He was trying to hide what was really the truth, and he was trying to hide what was really what was going on. And here was, here was Peter. He was allowing the Jewish influence of the church and those that were coming in to influence and change the way that he knew he really was in his life. And the truth was he really did enjoy fellowship with the Gentiles. He, he really did see life, seeing them get saved. He was really having a good time seeing them grow and seeing the churches grow and see these Gentile churches grow. But yet somehow or another, he was so worried about what someone else thought about him and so worried about how they might judge him that he was willing to sacrifice that relationship with these people and sacrifice what he knew to be the truth in order just to impress and just to make these people happy. He was willing to dissemble himself. He was willing to live under these people and to conceal under false appearance 
who he really was. And here was Peter who was trying to pretend, well, when these people were around, that he was some sort of devout Jew. At the same time, these people, they knew the difference. And then while he was pretending to be a devout Jew, he demanded that these people become Jews. And they're over there going, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. How, why all of a sudden do we have to become Jews? Just because they show up. I, I don't understand that. I don't understand. Why do I have to now all of a sudden live differently just, just because they showed up? Shouldn't we just live consistently all the time? Shouldn't we just live the same all the time? If the truth is the truth and you've taught that this is the truth and you've taught the way that we're doing is fine and it's good and it's good, how come all of a sudden it changes just because they show up, just, just, just because they bring it? And from what we can see from the Word of God, Paul, he's helping us understand what they're teaching is false doctrine and it's not even true according to the Word of God, but yet just because they show up, now all of a sudden we, we have to do that. We have to abandon what we know just, just to impress these people over here. How many of you have, not by show of hands, but how many of you have ever tried or wished that you were part of the cool crowd at school, right? Wish that you were the cool crowd at school, and then almost what happens? The cool people seem like they're always, it seems like always the cool people are always the dumb ones, right? Because the cool people are always trying to find some nerd somewhere to help them get good grades on their school, Right? So they make friends, and I'm sure there's, there's been movies about it, right, where they make friends with the nerd or the uncool kid, you know, and they try to do it all in secret, right, so, so they can get better grades or do something like that. And then what happens? When they get into the public setting within the whole school, all of a sudden they act as if they don't even know that individual. I'm, I don't know you. You're, you're, you're a nerd, man. We're part of the cool crowd over here. I don't know who you are. Why are you talking to me? They're dissembling, pretending under false pretense, and so they're acting one way around certain people and acting a different way around another person, and so what does it do to this, this poor person over here who just wants to try to fit in, and man, you spent time with me all week long, and now all of a sudden you pretend like you don't even know me? All, all of a sudden, I'm not, a, I'm not a cool person anymore. All of a sudden, I'm not worth fellowshipping with each other. You, you change, and, I, and, and, it, and it hurts that relationship, and it causes a divide between those two. And he dissembled and he tried to act a certain way. And, and here he was just because they showed up. All of a sudden, Peter now, Peter now, he's the strict Jewish code guy. Now all of a sudden, he's, he's following just because they showed up. Acts chapter 10, verse 14 says, But Peter said, No, it's not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. So he knew how to be the strictest Jew. But yet somehow or another, so long as they weren't there, he could fellowship with the Gentiles. It was okay. I like what John Gill said about this portion about Peter. His conduct did not agree with true sentiments of his mind, which he covered. He caused other Jews to conceal their true sentiments and acted the very reverse of them and their former conduct, just so that he could impress these people, just so that he could fit in in this area, just so that it was okay here. But he didn't understand that his hypocrisy had built a following and his hypocrisy had led many great other men astray. We can see from our text here that in verse number 13, and other Jews dissembled likewise with them. They, oh, I, I, guess if, I guess if Peter, if, if this is how we're supposed to live, I, I guess if, when other Jews show up, we, we become Jews now again all of a sudden. We become strict Jews all of a sudden just because these people show up. I, I guess we do that now. I, I guess that's the way we live. We have to just, who come, I wonder who's going to come on Sunday, whether I live this way or not. I, I, I guess I, we, they didn't know what to do. In so much that Barnabas was also carried away. With their dissimulation. You know, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And so we can see from our text in verse number 13, the word dissembled, and it changes a little bit there at the end of verse 13 with their dissimulation. This word dissimulation means a feigning, false pretense hypocrisy, a concealment of opinions, sentiments, or purpose. It includes the assuming of a false or counterfeit appearance which conceals the real opinions or purpose. Webster's 18.28. In other words, there are so many of God's people, as is illustrated by Peter, by Peter here, that depending on who's in the room is how they show what they believe or who they really are, depending on who's in the room. Depending on who comes to the front door, depending on who shows up at church, it's going to determine on how I live and how I, how I act and how I live and maybe even how I present myself in my spiritual lives. It's kind of like this. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without 
practice simulation. In other words, God says, if you love me, you love me no matter who's in the room. How many of you would say, I love you to your spouse? Right? I love you to your spouse. Yet at the same time, we'll only hold their hand when certain people are in the room or in certain places. Right? It's just without dissimulation. We either love our wife and love our spouse no matter where we are, no matter who we're with. Right? If all of a sudden it's awkward or weird to hold your, your wife's hand, depending on who somebody's there, do we, it's love with dissimulation. And it's the same with our Christian lives. All of a sudden, man, I, I love to fellowship with that guy, and then as soon as somebody else shows up, oh, I don't know, they act as if they don't even know that person anymore. It's, it's love without dissimulation. God says we have to live a, a consistent life. If we can fellowship with this person and, and have fellowship with them, it doesn't make any difference. It should never make any difference who shows up or walks in the door. If we have our church service and we believe a certain thing about the Bible, we continue to believe and preach, and no matter who comes in the back door, we're the same consistent lives. In our lives. So many of God's people live a different life. They live one life on Sundays and Tuesday nights. And they live a whole different life the rest of the week. Really depending on who shows up or who's in the room. Love without dissimulation. Here, here, Peter had caused many a man to temporarily even change his beliefs. And I, I don't know, what, what do I do now? And Peter knew that those of the circumcision, he knew they were teaching a false doctrine, yet he was so worried about what they were going to think, and he was so worried about appeasing them, and he was so worried about making them happy and doing whatever he was willing to forego and even abandon what he knew was the truth just to impress these people. At the same time, he was causing a split within the church because he was causing confusion and dissension and dissimulation with others. They needed to see a consistent leader. They needed to see a consistent apostle preaching the truth of God's word to help them come in. They sure, most surely could have come in and he could have extended them the right hand of fellowship. He could have extended them an opportunity to worship in their service. But Peter could have exactly said at the same time, while y'all are here, this is what we preach and teach and it's going to stay the same. It doesn't matter just because you're in the room. He caused them to do that. He caused a man to follow peer pressure, even when knowing better. I love this, and I, one of my commentators is right. You know, the majority is not always right. The majority is not always right. In fact, many times the majority is usually wrong. But yes, so many people, we get on to teenagers all the time, don't follow after peer pressure, don't follow after peer pressure, peer pressure is going to get you. But you know, adults follow more peer pressure than teenagers ever do. They'll follow it. They'll do whatever it takes. And a, good way, a good way to know if you're a dissembling kind of person is if the boss shows up, if you work a little harder, if the boss shows up or if the boss is gone, do you work the same? If the boss shows up and you work a little harder, that's dissimulation. According to God's word, that's a sin. It's not right. We, we had to live consistent lives. No matter who shows up, no matter who's there, what kind of testimony are we leaving for everyone else? I thought you were a Christian. You said you are a Christian, but now we see you just like us. You, you pretend to be a hard worker, but you're really only honestly a hard worker when the boss is around. You're really only a hard worker when teacher's not looking at the board or watching what we're doing. It's dissimulation. It's, we ought to live a consistent life. I mean, think about it. Teen fashion, social media, mainstream media are all things that pull in different directions in all kinds of different ways. But the gospel is still the same no matter who's there. And our Christian lives ought to be the same no matter what's taking place in our lives. It doesn't make any difference. If preacher shows up, we really honestly shouldn't have to change the channel. It, it ought to be the same. Well, preacher, I, we can't let preacher know we watch this kind of thing. We listen to this. Turn him out. Oh, preacher's showing up. Change the channel on the, on the volume remote. Change the channel. Wait, wait, what's, what's going on? It's dissimulation. It's sin. It's wrong. What are we teaching our kids? Or we're sitting in the back seat. What are you teaching them? Some things are right. Some things are wrong. It's dissimulation. And Paul wanted to remind Peter of his preaching. He wanted to remind him of where he came from. He wanted to remind him of the teacher that he had, Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds Peter, Peter of the indiscriminate gospel. You live the same no matter where you are, no matter who you're with, no matter where you're around, it's the same. Nationality has nothing to do with righteousness. He understood that you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by becoming a Jew and following Jewish laws. Salvation doesn't need anything added to it. 
doesn't. Once we're saved, there's not two or more ways for someone to live righteously. Titus chapter 2, verse 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. As we can read Titus 2.12, there's no disclaimers that you live righteously, soberly, and godly depending on who's there. No, we live righteously, godly all of the time. As we had, as Brother Hauser was teaching, uh, teaching one of our uh, men's devotions, he taught men, our, our dads, we ought to have some consistent lives. We had some, some lives of integrity. And his son defined it great. Integrity is doing right no matter who's around. That's living a life of consistency, not living a life of dissimulation or dissembling others around us. His solution here, and Paul was giving the solution in verse number 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. These people were teaching false doctrine, Peter, and you knew that, but you're so worried about impressing and making these people happy. You were willing to sacrifice what you knew to be the truth, and it was damaging other people. And for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And pictures so many, and Peter, unfortunately, here he's pictured, he pictures so many of God's people living a double standard. My wife and I have made a decision. The way we dress is the same whether we're in church or whether we're at camp out. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. The music that we live, listen to is the same at church that we listen to throughout the week. The things that we do in our lives are the same. It doesn't matter. I don't, dis- I don't decide. I don't, I, don't, I don't pray and say, Lord, give me a message. Well, let's see. I don't know who's going to be coming to church this morning. Do I want to preach that or do I want to kind of change it just because I know who's going to preach the next day? We wouldn't want that at all from our preacher. We want him to preach the truth no matter who's in the auditorium. But so many live different lives. Live two different lives. Many Christians are living two lives. They're, they have their church life and they have their week life. How they live and act depends on who's around them or who shows up. Well, this we're gonna have a birthday party, but we've invited all the church kids, so we gotta we have a we're gonna have a different birthday party than we normally do because there's gonna be church kids there. It's dissimulation, it's living a double life, it's living a double standard, it's dissimulation, it's sin. God says we live consistently. Peter also pictures how many Christians are becoming stumbling blocks and they become stumbling blocks to other Christians, to other young Christians. I think about it. How many friends or family would be dis... I, I wrote this in my notes and I love this. I want to make sure I say it right. How many friends or family would be surprised if they visited you at church or if the pastor suddenly showed up unannounced? Would be surprised. I got family and friends over. Preacher shows up. Oh, that's, oh, that's your pastor coming. Oh, all of a sudden, now I'm in a quandary. I've, I've been doing this, this, and this. Now preacher's here, but I, I can't let preacher see what I'm doing with these people. So you know what I'll do? I'll go out and pre- hang on, preacher. I'll open the door, step out, close the door behind me. How you doing, preacher? I want your fellowship, yeah? What's really happening is there's something inside the house I don't want preacher to see that I'm participating in, I'm doing, but I don't want him to see it. So I'm going to stand out here and pretend to be a little more righteous than what I was doing inside there. So I don't want, and I don't want those people to see that I'm fellowshiping with the preacher because when I go back in there, they're going to understand, hey, he's... He was that, was, that was his preacher. I, I, that doesn't even make sense. And so let's close the door. Let's have some little dissimulation. Let's, have a, let's live a little bit of a, a different life between here and there. And it's interesting that in this world today, Christians, Christians expect their pastor and they expect their staff to live a certain way, to dress a certain way, to listen to certain music, and be completely faithful to church. And they should. Amen. Hey, next Sunday, we don't have to be here. That's good. I guess you're teaching us the next Sunday morning. We expect that. We expect the preacher and we expect his family to be consistently faithful all the time. We expect preacher to always be preacher. We always expect that, right? We expect that all the time. We expect that when, when he comes to visit us in the hospital, he's he's. Preacher, he's pastor, right? We, we expect that all the time. Can you imagine if one Sunday, okay, well, you know, we're doing chili cook-off. We're just kind of relaxed today and having a good time. If I stepped up into this pulpit wearing jeans and a golf shirt, how many of you be going, oh, what is going on with Brother Oster? What's going on? I will just 
just to let you know, I'll always be up here in a suit and tie. But we expect that. We expect our missionaries to be consistently faithful. We, don't, we expect our missionaries to send prayer letters. We expect missionaries to come back and, make, these, and make, their, make their reports and say, we planted this church, and this church has been planted, and we, these men are being trained, and this church is going to be sent out, and these young men are being sent. We expect a certain lifestyle, a certain attitude from our missionaries. And when we go visit missionaries on the foreign field, we expect them to just continue to be missionaries and watch their fields and do their works. And we don't expect them. We expect them to be missionaries. Yet the same life it seems like so many of God's people, as in Peter, have expectations for others, and if they're there, we'll live that way. But other times we want to live this way, but yet we still expect them to live the way that we expect them to live. And if we're over here, we demand these people be just like us, just because hey, we're we're around preacher now. We have to act a certain way. Our preacher's coming over, guys. You guys gotta. You guys, don't, don't be on your phone while preachers here. We live a different way. Many Christians, unfortunately, are living lives of dissimulation. They pretend to be righteous on the weekend and yet live a completely different life the rest of the week. At the same time, they're, that's happening. They're expecting others to maintain the weekend life. But one cannot expect others to live one way that they themselves do not want to live. Here's Peter. Paul is telling Peter... You're around these Gentiles and you're helping them to grow and yet you demand that they live differently just because this individual or these individuals show up and it's especially bad when you know that they're even teaching a false doctrine. That they're teaching something that's not true. Christians are living in dissembled lives. Think about it this way. And we'll wrap that up. Imagine if pastor and his wife dressed and were faithful and posted on social media like the rest, what would we say? Imagine it. Think about it. Many are living around the world one way and another way around God's people, all requiring that those people remain godly. We expect the preacher and his, his family, missionaries, we expect them to remain godly. And yet, we can live a different way when we're not with preacher. Or around preacher, we can live a different life. We can live a, diff- a different life completely. It's a dissembled life. It's not right. It's not godly. Many of God's people watch all kinds of movies that if preacher was there, we, oh, we can't let him see that one. That's, I know it's our favorite movie, but we can't let him see that we watch that one. Those TV shows, make sure we DVR it so we can watch it when we know no one else is going to be there to watch it with us. Those magazines, y'all remember magazines? I think they still have magazines nowadays. Do they still have magazines? Are they still here? Websites. Got to make sure we keep that. We got to make sure we keep that history cleared because you never know who might click on that computer screen. Keep it cleared. Jokes are funny depending on who's around, right? I know the Bible says we shouldn't be drinking alcohol, so as long as preacher doesn't know it's in here, we'll keep the cans in the backyard somewhere so he can't smell or hear them or see them. Smoking, etc. It's amazing, and all of it becomes bad depending on who is around or who shows up or what day of week it is. And as pa- Paul told Peter, and as he lived his life as the example by the power of the Holy Spirit, We ought to live the same way we expect others to live, no matter who is present, no matter who is there. I don't have, I I use a little USB, I don't have, I don't have CDs or I don't listen to radio or anything like that, I just have a little USB of the music that we like to listen to. My friends, I don't have a different USB for depending on who is going to be sitting in my car with me. I took the teenagers to the youth rally, I didn't put youth rally music in there. So that preacher could have his testimony while that time. It was the same exact music. I got in the car and listened to what I listened to all the time. It's the same. It's the same. Peter was not being genuine in who he claimed to be. He was living a dissembled life. We have every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. I would encourage you to allow God, let the Holy Spirit 
begin to teach and show and to be faithful to every church service, to be in his Bible every day, to be a testimony all the time, 